Uh, we've got a special guest with us today, Jennifer Farr Davis. She's logged over 12,000 miles on six different continents, including trails like Pacific Crest Trail, Colorado Trail, uh, the Appalachian Trail. Uh, she has a new book called Again, which chronicles her journey of 47 miles per day over 46 days. And she's been featured on the New York Times, Washington Post, Talk of the Nation, Daily Beast, uh, the list goes on. Um, she's agreed to come here and give a talk to us today. Uh, and I'm very excited to have her. So please help me welcome Jennifer Farr Davis. It's always fun to share some of my hiking stories. And like Andrew said, I've been able to hike all over the world on six different continents. I have not been to Antarctica because I'm a wimp in cold weather, which we talked about. Um, but of all the places where I have hiked and I have traveled, the one trail that means the most to me and the trail that has changed my life the most is the Appalachian Trail. And where I come from in North Carolina, we call it the Appalachian Trail. You may have heard the Appalachian Trail, right? Well, that's not correct, just so you know. It's, it's the Appalachian Trail, or at least we can all agree on the AT, okay? And I've done the entire 2,185 mile AT three separate times. And it was the most recent time in 2011 where with my husband's help and a whole lot of help from friends and family and hikers and runners, we set the overall record. So for 46 straight days, I averaged 47 miles a day. And that's crazy, exactly, right? Someone said it, yes. We can all, we can all agree that that's crazy, but hopefully we can also agree that a journey of any distance or any speed is always going to start with a single step. Yes? And my first step into the wilderness didn't take place until I was 21 years old. And that is so sad. It is. I grew up in a beautiful area, but Nowadays, I mean, with school being so demanding and extracurriculars taking up so much time, unless your family's really focused on going outdoors, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time in nature. So I graduated from college, and I didn't know anything about the wilderness. And that really bothered me. And I felt like because I didn't know much about the natural world, I really didn't know myself. So I wanted to take some time to try and fix that. And growing up in North Carolina, I had heard about the Appalachian Trail. I had never set foot on it before. In fact, I would only spent two nights in the woods my entire life. But the good news is, at age 21, that doesn't matter, right? Inexperience never seems to matter to a 21-year-old. And I decided that I was going to get out and do that entire trail by myself. So I started on my own with my brother's old Boy Scout gear in Georgia, and my goal was to walk all the way up to Maine. And that first journey, I was out there for five full months, which is very standard when you're trying to hike the entire trail. But at the time, it was the five hardest months I had ever known. And even though it was 10 years ago, I'll still today say it was also the five best months of my entire life because the trail completely changed me. And I needed that. I liked the woman at the end a heck of a lot more than the girl who started. And I could spend all day telling you about that first journey. It was so foundational. I could tell you lessons I learned, describe folks I met along the way because trust me, there's some characters. <laughs> but you guys are at work. You don't have all day. We got to get you back and being productive and solving all the Google problems. And so I'm going to try to sum up that journey and that transformation by reading a short passage from my first book. And this book chronicles um, my initial journey down the Appalachian Trail. And it's got a really strange name. It's called Becoming Odessa. Half the people read the book, and they still can't pronounce the title. But just so you know, Odessa is my trail name. And it's really common when you go and you hike these long paths that while you're out there, you take a nickname that hikers call a trail name. 
I know we have hikers in here. Do we have any trail names? Are you willing to share? Doc. Doc? Yes. Did you take that or was someone else but gave it, it to you? Kind of given to you. Kind of given to you. Well, that's the point I'm going for because hikers love to try and give other hikers their trail name. In my first week out there, uh, by the way, if you can't tell, I am six feet tall. And I've been this height since eighth grade. <laughs> In my first week on the trail, I got suggestions like Sasquatch, Amazon, and Stretch. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all those old wounds from middle school were just ripped open. You know? <laughs> And I didn't want any of those, but then I was being a dork and comparing the trail to Homer's Odyssey. And another hiker said, well, what about Odysseus? And I liked that. But I was proud to be a woman out there because there weren't that many, especially hiking by themselves. So I wanted a feminine trail name, and we changed Odysseus to Odissa, and I've been Odissa ever since. So here's a passage from the last full day of Odissa's first journey. When people had asked why I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, one of the answers I had given was that I wanted time to think about where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do for a living. And the trail would give me plenty of time to do that. But now that I was at the end, I didn't feel any closer to knowing those answers than when I started. The only thing I felt more certain of at the end of this journey was myself. I was no longer defined by my resume, and I didn't give answers based on what I thought other people wanted to hear. For the first time in my life, I knew who I was, and I was okay with who I was. At the end of this journey, I knew that something deep within me connected with nature, and with hard work, and with simplicity. I also learned that I was both stubborn and tough. A lot tougher than I thought I was, especially when I let other people help me along the way. Now, when it was all said and done, I got off trail and I got a job. I mean, much to my mother's relief, you know, I got a job. And it was a good job. I was working with fun people, living in a great place. And I think everything said I should have been happy. I should have been content. But then the weeks started to pass and the months started to pass and all I could think about was the trail. And I missed it. I missed moving through nature. I mean, my job was great, but it was a desk job. And I sat there for eight hours a day. And while I sat there, I longed for the friends I had made on the trail. It was the first environment I had been a part of where the people who were the closest to me were extremely different from me. That had made life really fun and really interesting. But surprisingly, and I'm going to say surprisingly, because when I started, I was your typical 21-year-old, and I was leaving behind my friends and my family and my computer and TV. And I was terrified that at times I would be really bored and really lonely. But then when it was over, I longed for the silence and the solitude that I had discovered as much as I longed for my friends. But the thing I miss most of all sounds really strange because I missed how beautiful I felt on the trail. And I promise you, when I was out there, I was filthy. I mean, covered in dirt. We won't even talk about the smell because I don't think you can put it into words. And it's, it's East Coast smell, which by the way is way worse than West Coast smell. Plus there were scrapes, bug bites, bruises all over my body. But here's the thing, for five months, I didn't have a mirror. And I don't know if this is funny or sad, but the other week I went into a middle school and I literally had to explain that this was before the day of the selfie. Like, I wasn't taking digital pictures of myself the entire way. Plus, I didn't have billboards, magazines, or commercials telling me what I should look like. So I started to see myself through my interactions with other hikers. If I made someone else smile, that made me feel pretty. 
Also growing up, I had always thought that nature was beautiful. But I had never seen myself as a part of nature and a part of all that beauty until I walked the trail. And finally, after hiking through 14 states, which I love saying that on the West Coast, because it makes it sound so far, you know, <laughs> so long. But after, after hiking through 14 states, at that point, I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And that's the gift of the trail. I mean, it makes you realize you can do so much more than you once thought was possible. It exposes you to new things, new horizons, new trails. And I decided that I really wanted to do more, on and off the trail, more than I once thought was possible. So as time passed, I started saving up money from work. I started saving up time away from work. And I started to plan another big hike. And one of the great things about being a hiker is that there are trails everywhere. I mean, all over the US, all over the world. And in my opinion, hiking is one of the most affordable, accessible, and best ways to travel. So I actually want to take a minute and share some of my favorite hiking pictures from different trails around the world with you all. And as the pictures scroll through, I'll try to tell you where they were taken. So we'll start our journey in Africa at Mount Kilimanjaro. Like the tide, my hand moves with your chest. Steady now, moon will pull a slow and even breath. This is on the 600 mile Bibbleman track. See that big lizard. The storm rolls in, I see it in your eyes. The southwest corner of Australia, so just beneath Perth. big spiders. And here we go to Peru. This is in Cotahuasi Canyon. And that hurts. <laughs> that hurt a lot. This is actually one of the deepest canyons in the world and there are no official trails. There's just all these old trading routes that people still use. So we were able to navigate the entire canyon. The next pictures come from the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, which I know some of you have been on. And this is a trail y'all should all check out at some point. This is the Pacific Crest Trail. Runs about 2,700 miles all the way through California, Oregon, and Washington. These, these pictures are not in order. So this is Washington. This is in the High Sierras. It's a marmot friend. That's Crater Lake in Oregon. Back up in Washington, and those go to me. All the rest of the pictures are going to come from different parts of Europe. This is in the Alps, that's Mont Blanc in the background. This is in Iceland. These pictures, these next few pictures are from a 50 mile trail in Iceland, but there's more diversity in that 50 miles than maybe the entire Appalachian Trail. The last few shots are from the United Kingdom. This is from the coast of Wales, and then there's some shots from Scotland. <laughs> that was a monument at the end of the West Highland Way in Scotland, and I always thought, that's the perfect way to end a hike, you know, have that statue. So hopefully you guys enjoyed those pictures. Be glad that I did not sing. That would not be a pleasurable experience. But 
the point of showing those images is just that the trail, I mean, I'm not a good photographer. I'm not. But the trail can take you to these incredible places. They're just so stunning, so mind-blowing. And by the time, I mean, for several years, I just worked to hike and worked to hike and worked to hike. But by the time I was 25, I had admitted I had a problem. And I said this recently, and someone yelled back, and 12 steps just wasn't going to fix it. <laughs> and I was, that's right. I was a hiker. I was. All my time, all my money, it was going to the trail. So at that point, I actually quit my day job to start my own hiking company. Because what I really wanted to do is get other people outside. And I thought I could do it through writing and speaking and guiding on the trail. But I still wanted to hike a little on my own, too. And I was in the very beginning phases of planning for my next trip when all of a sudden something happened that I thought might ruin everything. Any guesses? Ankle. Ankle? <laughs> that is such a sweet, naive guess. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I fell in love. Way worse than twisting an ankle. I mean, I, I fell in love, I got engaged, and I was convinced that at the time in my life when I was ready to be married, I would need to be ready to settle down, or at least just slow down. But I was really fortunate to meet this great guy who loves me for me, which is the crazy hiker. And he's extremely supportive. But maybe most important of all, I ended up marrying a fellow who at the time was a public school teacher. So what does that mean? That's right. This could work, right? <laughs> and truthfully, I had always wanted to have adventures with someone else. I mean, I had gone on my own, but I had always wanted to share it. And I told Brew, that's my husband, I told him on our very first date that I wanted to hike the entire Appalachian Trail again. So he knew what he was getting into. But as much as he loved me, even after we were engaged, he still did not want to hike 2,185 miles with me. Imagine that. So we started to talk about how I could hike, but how we could also spend time together. And we came up with the idea of doing a supported hike. Now, a supported hike is going to take a long trail like the AT and basically turn it into a series of day hikes. Because now, instead of carrying my big heavy pack with tent, sleeping bag, several days worth of food, all I had to carry was a day pack with just the items I needed to reach the next road crossing. Because at every road crossing, there would be my husband. And what else would be there? Food, that's right. Food, gear, supplies, fresh socks. Fresh socks are like the best thing ever when you're a hiker. They are. So I could get whatever I wanted, but just what I needed to reach the next trip. And as soon as we decided that we would complete the trail in that manner and knowing we wanted to do it in the summer months when we could be together, I decided that I also wanted to try and establish a women's record on the trail. Because as long as I had heard about supported hikes, not all of them, but a number of them had been in regards to records. People trying to go very quickly. But every record I had ever heard of on the Appalachian Trail, not just speed, oldest hiker. By the way, do you want to guess how old the oldest hiker to do it all at once was? 83. 83. Youngest hiker? Five. Five. The person who had done it the most times, which is 17 times, that's over 35,000 miles. I mean, all those records, all those marks, several folks who had hiked the trail legally blind, but they were all men, all of them. Every single record, every single mark belonged to a man. And I'm all about some girl power. So I thought, there should be a women's record, too. And truthfully, there wasn't one. So I figured if we were smart and if I stayed healthy, we'd probably accomplish that goal. And it was back on June 8, 2008, when Brew and I got married. And it was lovely. But then just 12 days later, we started the trail. 12 days later. <laughs> and once again, I could spend all day telling you about this one journey. And I won't, but I will say, if you ever really want to work on communication, 
<laughs> I mean, that might be a good team building exercise, like to do a supported hike for a couple days, because it forces you to communicate. And after 57 days of working together, communicating, being a team, we got to the end. And we accomplished our goal when we arrived. We established a women's record. And along the way, I averaged 38 miles a day. 38 miles a day, OK? And that's not too shabby, right? I mean, it was hard, and it was challenging, but I was surprised at how much I loved it. I loved it. And now when I look back to that summer, sometimes I feel like, well, sure, I should have loved it. Because there I was a newlywed on cloud nine out on my favorite trail, getting to do exactly what I loved to do all day, every day. And meanwhile, the man who I love more than anyone was running all of my errands, every <laughs> single one. <laughs> But when we got to the end, Brew and I hiked up the last mountain together. And on the summit, there's a plaque that represents the end. So we went up to it, and we both put our hands on it. And as soon as we did, I turned to my husband, just grinning from ear to ear. And then he turned to me, and he said, we are never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> and he meant it. <laughs> But there was one very small problem. And that was we hiked off that mountain to get to our car and go home. But as we descended down the trail, I knew that I could have kept going. I knew I still had something left, something substantial. And now I also realize that when you're trying to set a record on a very long trail, it's not about speed or strength or gender. What do you think it's all about? You guys tell me, what do you think it's all about? You can point if you don't want to talk. Here, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Support, I mean, someone has to help you along the way. There's a lot of factors. But I was thinking through those factors, and now there was this small voice inside of me that said, I might, I might have what it would take to set the overall record. But I took that voice and I just whoosh, buried it down deep, and I thought it would probably go away. And the next few summers, Brew and I agreed to hike much shorter trails. Granted, when I say shorter, I am still talking about 500 miles. So they were decent trails, but shorter. We hiked at a slower pace, side by side. And even Brew would tell you that we had so much fun. We went out. There's a trail in Colorado from Denver to Durango. So we did that together, and it was awesome. And then the following summer, we went over to Europe, and there are footpaths everywhere in Europe. And we just had this incredible time. But meanwhile, what do you think happened to the small voice? Did it go away? No. Use your hands again. Got bigger, got stronger, and it got to the point where I knew there were only two options. Either we go back and try, at least try for the record, or else I would always look back and I would always wonder what might have been. And I didn't want to do that. So I sat down with Brew and we had a long conversation. And I was shameless. I used every bribe, every bargaining chip I could think of, which included football game tickets, uh, really good craft beer, <laughs> and also future offspring. You know, I figured if I was going to carry his stuff for nine months, then he should carry mine a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> and it, it worked. I mean, he agreed to help me one more time. So in the summer of 2011, we went back to the Appalachian Trail for the third time. Do we have any East Coasters in here? OK. I'll ask the question. We decided we wanted to start in Maine, not down in Georgia. Why? Whether we actually got the worst of the bugs. We traded the maximum amount of daylight for the worst of the bugs. But weather, crowds, wanting to hike home, that was part of it, 
However, the primary reason we wanted to start up in Maine is because Maine and New Hampshire are the toughest two states on the entire path. Most of the time hiking up there, it's not just walking with your feet, it's literally scrambling up mountains or sort of sliding down them. And if you're going to get knocked off because of weather, it's probably going to happen up in Maine or New Hampshire. So we thought, well, let's just get through that in the beginning. So we started up in Maine in mid-June. And for the first few days, everything went about how we thought it would. Then on day five, I was going up one of those steep mountains in Maine, and on my way to the summit, I noticed a sharp pain that was developing in my right leg, in between my knee and my ankle. And by the time I got up to the ridge, I was in so much discomfort that all I could do was limp down the trail. And I kept limping until the exact same pain that was in my right leg developed in my left leg. By the end of the afternoon, I had full-blown shin splints. And I can usually look out and I can tell exactly who's had shin splints because I'll say the word and folks will grimace if they've had them. Just grimace like it's the worst thing ever. Because it's the worst thing ever. I mean, it really is. And if you've had shin splints, then you know, I mean, walking is very difficult. Going uphill is excruciating, but going downhill is unbearable. There were times on my descent where I would plant my foot and my leg would just buckle beneath me because of the pain and I collapsed down to the trail. But I was convinced that my injury had been caused by the high mileage days on the rocks in Maine. I trained really hard, but I trained down south where we have a lot of nice dirt trails. And up in Maine and New Hampshire, they have a lot of exposed, unforgiving granite. However, if I could just make it to Vermont. Vermont's trail name, its nickname is actually Vermud. It is. It's the one state where you take a step and you lift your foot and the shoe is no longer attached to it. You know what I'm saying? It's shoe sucking mud. It's sloppy and it's messy, but it's soft. And I thought it might be soft enough to where my legs could start to heal. So that was my goal, get to Vermont. And all I had to do was hike through New Hampshire to make it there. <laughs> exactly. And e <laughs> even getting into New Hampshire, I was in so much pain that almost every time I got to the top of a mountain, I would actually turn around and then hike or scramble downhill backwards. And you see a lot of hikers on the Appalachian Trail, and no one once stopped and asked me, hey, aren't you that girl who's trying to set the record? No, but at that point on the trail, someone literally stopped and asked if I was lost or confused. I mean, they thought I was backtracking because I was hiking backwards. <laughs> yeah. But like so many times in life, and I think especially with technology, like so many times in life, by being willing to take a few steps backwards, I was able to keep going forward. And I got to New Hampshire, and if there's one state on the entire trail where I wake up and I just pray for good weather, it's New Hampshire. When I arrived, I had 24 hours of decent weather. Then I started up the slopes of Mount Washington. And Mount Washington's not only one of the highest mountains on the trail, and I'm not going to tell you how high, because you West Coasters will poo-poo it, but it's high. <laughs> and at one point, it had the highest recorded wind speed of any place on the planet. It's notorious for its wind and its bad weather. And sure enough, as soon as I got above tree line, wind picked up. We're talking the type of wind that can knock you over. And then the clouds rolled in, and then on top of that, the rain started to fall. And out of all the trails I've walked, the Appalachian Trail relatively is the most well marked. It's very difficult to get lost on the AT. Until you're above tree line and the next trail marker is 40 yards away and you can't see 10 feet in front of your face. Then it becomes very easy to get lost. And I got off trail. It took several hours and several miles for me to recorrect. And even when I got back to the right path, 
it was such slow going. Because all those rocks were slick, wet rocks. And I was slipping. I was falling. But I kept telling myself that at some point, it would have to change. Couldn't stay like that forever. And it finally changed after a day and a half of torrential rain when I got up to another high ridge. And there the last week of June, I was no longer in the rainstorm because now I was in the middle of a sleet storm. And I thought I was prepared. I had great gear, but I don't care what type of Gore-Tex you're wearing after a day and a half straight of pounding rain, water gets in or sweat does not get out. So I was up there soaking wet, shivering. I was starving. And yes, I always have to explain, I did have extra food. But again, at some point, you lose A, the dexterity, or B, the desire to open another frozen cliff bar and just lick it. You know, like that is not much fun. So I was up there, and I was in bad shape. And I wanted to do anything to take my mind off the conditions. And I mentioned earlier that when I sing, I have a horrible voice. But when things go really bad on the trail, I'll, t I'll start to sing to help take my mind off of it. And I <laughs> decided to belt out one of my favorite tunes up on the ridge. But from the very beginning, I was just slurring the song. And I was mumbling all the words. And oh yeah, I was tripping like every five or six steps. So finally, I acknowledged what deep down I already knew. I was moderately hypothermic, and it was becoming a lot worse very quickly. By the time I got to the base of the mountain, I was so cold and I was so stiff that I could barely bend my joints. I remember because there were all these rock steps, and I kept feeling like I could not bend my knee to get to the next one. But Brew, we had not communicated. He assumed, my husband assumed there had been really nasty weather. And so he hiked in as far as he could, and he set up our tent. And as soon as I saw the tent, I got inside. Now, I was so rigid, I couldn't even undress myself. He had to help me out of cold, wet clothes into two sleeping bags. And for the next 30 minutes, I lay there, and I just shivered. But when I finally started to relax just a little bit, what do you think I wanted to do next? Get up? Yeah, wait, I heard a lot of things. They're all correct, but the first thing I wanted to do was eat. And food is wonderful medicine for hypothermia. It warms you from the inside out. And in the next 20 minutes, I consumed over 3,000 calories. Yeah. Yeah, and I know that for a fact because Brew took some type of sick pleasure in actually counting, like keeping a running tally of all the calories that I was eating on every single wrapper. So at that point, I felt a little bit better, and I wanted to try to keep hiking. And Brew packed in the tent. He brought the food. He even remembered extra clothes. So I was able to put on a warm fleece and a dry rain jacket. But as I was getting dressed, I realized there was not an extra pair of pants. So I turned to the corner of the tent where my cold, wet, icy rain pants sat in the middle of a puddle. And then I turned to my husband. <laughs> I glanced back at the puddle and back at Brew and said, I want your pants. <laughs> and my husband's here, by the way. I'm hoping you'll get to meet him at the end of the talk. But he is the sweetest guy. And this is so brew. He did not bat an eye. He did not disagree. All he said during this entire exchange was, at least ask nicely. You know, he's like, at least say please. So I did. And then I kept hiking in his pants. And he packed up all our gear and marched everything back to the road crossing on June 27th, wearing the Grinch that stole Christmas boxers. And I will <laughs> never, never forget that detail. But I tell that story not to talk about my husband's underwear. I tell that story like so many others that I could share because it clearly illustrates that it's the support. It's the support that's so key in this type of endeavor. I mean, if Brew had not assumed there had been bad weather, if he had not hiked in, if he had forgotten the extra food or the extra clothes, I would not have been able to keep going. And 
I know people ask all the time, why would you want to set a record? What's valuable about that experience? And for me, one thing that was really important was it took this trail that when I hiked as a 21-year-old, it had taught me all about independence and self-sufficiency. But now, eight years later, it's teaching me all about teamwork. It was teaching me that sometimes being able to ask for help is far more important than being independent. And it was teaching me that a strong team is always going to be better than a strong individual. I'll be the first to admit that there have been folks who I consider to be much better athletes who have gone after this mark, and they have not been successful because they did not have the level of support that I received. And <laughs> there, were, there were a lot of folks who helped us, but Brew was the only one who was with me from the beginning all the way to the end. And when I think about our record, I believe it has more to do with his support than with my athleticism. And one of the reasons I say that is because I know I would have quit without him. We got into Vermont, and I still had my shin splints. Now I had these weird side effects from the hypothermia. And because of that, or on top of that, I got really, really sick. And that's not fun at home, but it's especially not fun on the trail. The type of sick I had, I wasn't even on the trail. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, I was just running off trail every few minutes, grabbing striped maple leaves, everything. I mean, you know, I was just miserable. I was depleted, dehydrated, and giving all that I could, I still couldn't go one mile per hour. So for the first time on any trail, I quit. I quit 100% in my mind. I was finished. I was just going to get to that next road crossing. And when I made it there, we were headed home. So I finally arrived. <laughs> I walked out of the woods crying. And Brew was waiting for me. So I told him how sick I was. I told him how much I hurt. And I told him that we were finished with the trail. And this was the man who gave me the pants off his body. I mean, I knew that he was going to wrap me up in his arms, tell me it was OK, and then help get me to some place where I could start to feel better. So I looked at him waiting for my embrace. And he looked back at me, and he basically said, suck it up. <laughs> suck it up. <laughs> And there's this strange phenomenon where every time I tell this story, I literally get a little angry at my husband. Like, I get a little bit mad. But when it actually happened, I was shocked. I was caught completely off guard. Because he'll tell you, I mean, we had talked about it. This was my dream, not his. He said if it were up to him, we would be having a normal vacation like a normal family that summer. Yet here we were in Vermont. We were both uncomfortable. It was hot. It was humid. There were black flies everywhere. I had never felt so bad in my entire life, and he wouldn't let me quit. And here's what he said. He said, if you really want to quit, if that's truly what you want, that's fine. But you just can't quit right now. He said, right now, I think you feel too bad to make a good decision. So he said, I want you to eat, drink, take medicine, and then just keep going until tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, if you want to quit, I'll take you home. And I left that row crossing counting the minutes and the miles until I could officially stop. But after several miles passed, the medicine kicked in. I was able to hold in some food and some water, and I felt a little better. But when I felt a little better, I still felt horrible. Good. And no part of me thought that I could set the record. Because I was doing the math. I was there on day 12, averaging 38 miles a day. And that meant every day until the end, for five straight weeks, I was going to have to hike an average of 50 miles a day. And I didn't think that was possible. But I realized that my ultimate goal was not to set the record. My ultimate goal was to find my best on the trail. I mean, we had talked about it. Brew is a planner, so we're always talking five or 10 years out. And we knew we wanted our next adventure to be a family. I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to have kids. And I didn't want to have to look back and just always wonder, what did 100% look like for me 
on the trail? I wanted that answer. And so I decided to keep going, not necessarily for the record, but to really find what my best was on the trail. And there was this huge psychological shift that occurred. Because up until that point, we had fixated on numbers. Miles per hour, miles per day, where the previous record setter was at any given point. And in a lot of ways, it was his hike, not ours. But after Vermont, the one thing we said every day was just do your best. And after 46 days of doing our best and leaving it all out on the trail, we got to the end. And when we arrived, we, again, it was kind of a surprise, but we accomplished what almost everyone thought was impossible. And at times, what I thought was impossible, but Brew never believed that it was impossible. We set the overall record, and it was the first time that a woman had surpassed the mark of a man on a long distance trail. So it got some attention. It got some praise. It got some criticism. And it got a lot of questions. But here's what frustrated me. No one was asking the right questions. No one really got what it was all about. And I'm winding down. I know you all have to get back to work. But I want to take a quick minute and read a passage from my new book, Called Again, that shares some of my feelings and frustrations right after we finished. <clears throat> after the journey was over, Brew and I immediately gave multiple interviews and answered copious amounts of questions, but no one seemed to be asking the right questions. No one once, no one once asked what I had learned. No one asked what the most valuable part of the experience had been. Instead, everyone focused on the numbers. They wanted to talk about how I hiked and did not run 46.93 miles per day. They asked what I had to eat to consume over 6,000 calories per day. And they asked if I was scared to see 36 bears that summer. <laughs> scared? That was one of the highlights of the trip. Why didn't anyone ask about the notions of living in the present or choosing something purposeful and fulfilling over something fun and easy? What about the necessity of asking other people for help and of not succumbing to the fear of failure? Or the idea that persistence and consistency can be more valuable than speed and strength? Why didn't they ask about everyone else who had helped us? Wasn't it clear that this was a group endeavor? <laughs> and what about Brew? Why did no one realize that the most miraculous part of the summer was not the record, but how well my husband had loved me and served me along the way? I know that records are misunderstood. And I don't expect anyone to leave here today and want to go hike 47 miles. But I hope you do leave here knowing that when it comes to the record, it's about more than the numbers. And one thing I really like about the record or the fastest known time or whatever you want to call it is that it's an amateur pursuit. So you're doing it for the love of it. It's based on the honor system. And I promise you, when you get to the end, there's no trophy. There's not even a free t-shirt. <laughs> there's nothing there. But that doesn't mean there isn't a reward. And I've hiked in a lot of different ways. And that's one thing I love. It doesn't matter if I'm backpacking or guiding a trip or going out for a day hike with my daughter. Every time I go outdoors, there's a reward. And that's my hope for all of you. I know you spend a lot of time indoors solving all the world's problems. But I hope that you take some time to go outdoors and find your reward as well. Thank you. So I do have um, one last slideshow that includes pictures from the Appalachian Trail and our record. But before I show that, I do want to introduce my husband. And if you don't have to run off, we'd love to take questions. So we'll take about five or six minutes of questions, um, show the final slideshow. And then if y'all are interested in books, Google has them available at a discount for $10. And we're happy to sign those for you as well. So let's start with questions. Yeah. Have you done the, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, the Kalalua Trail on Kauai, Hawaii? 
Oh, is that the one on the cliffs? Yeah. No, we went to Hawaii, but we had our then 16-month-old daughter, and we decided that was probably not a family-friendly hike. <laughs> yeah, stay away from the cliffs. But uh, we've heard about it, and the hiking in Hawaii was incredible, and we would love to go back and do more. Where did you hike in Hawaii? It doesn't look like you did some hiking there. Sure. We were on um, the Big Island in Oahu, and we hiked a there's lot. A, the Big Island, there's a place called Waipio Valley that's west of Hilo, and we went there, and we hiked in Volcanoes National Park. And then um, the, uh, I guess on Oahu, we did some shorter hikes. Um, on the northwest side of the island, I can't remember the names, but I mean the ones that would be recognizable. We hiked around Diamond Head and kind Anoa of the more Falls. Park, like the close parks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's an. Uh, we hiked uh, in volcanoes. Did you say that? Yeah, a lot of a lot of good hiking in Hawaii. It's pretty rugged because it's just muddy and slippery and and volcanic too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Manoa Falls. That's right. So, yeah. 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 Um, other questions? Yeah. So before you go out on these long hikes. How you prepare yourself? Like what kind of training do you do? Yeah, I try to I try to train physically. Um, the thing I think is most helpful is climbing exercises with climbing. Cycling's really good. Um, I like to wear a heavy pack even when I train because it helps develop those muscles. Um, but anything physical you can do is helpful. I think it's important to prepare emotionally. Most people get off for emotional reasons, not physical reasons. So be prepared to be away from friends and family and not take showers every day. I mean, you have to kind of wrap your head around that. Um, and then some people really, they'll just kind of get in shape on the trail, which you can also do that because with work and life, sometimes it's hard to train or prepare. And the most important thing is to not try to go too fast too soon or carry too much weight because then you are more likely to get injured, especially if you haven't gotten ready. What would what be your favorite hike or your favorite place to go? Um, the Appalachian Trails asked the most, it's given the most, so it's my favorite. But on top of that, we loved Iceland. We loved Corsica. There's a 125 mile trail that runs the length of Corsica. I really liked Peru. Um, we did the Colorado Trail. Oh, yeah. um, that's about a not quite 500 mile trail from Durango to Denver, and it's really stunning, especially in the southern part closest to Durango. Um, yeah. Tour de Mont Blanc, did you mention that? It, uh, it was in the photos, okay. but. Tour de Mont Blanc, Italy, France, and Switzerland, that's a good one. We do them all again. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> the problem, yeah. So I heard there was a current DCT yo-yo attempt. Would you be interested in doing anything like that? For me, the Appalachian Trail record was kind of the pinnacle of these uh, feats of endurance. Um, partly because it's one of the oldest marks. Um, the first person to yo-yo the PCT, I think it was in 2006. So it's a relatively new thing and a very hard thing to accomplish. Plus having a family, I mean doing it one way is going to take, you know, even if you do it really fast, three months. Doing it both ways, you're gone for half of the year. Um, so now, I mean, my ultimate goal is just to get people outdoors and to experience the trail in as many different ways as possible. And I'm fortunate that everything lined up and I got to try for the record. But now we're section hikers, meaning we do it in pieces, you know, and we do, we have the guiding company at home, so we get people outdoors that way. And um, it's good. We take our daughter outside. It's a, definitely a different pace, but like, it's not better, it's not worse. It's just, it's all about seasons. Very little. Uh. We we have a friend who has um, he knows the roads around the Appalachian Trail really well because he he himself has hiked it 17 times, and he's also run support for people. And so before um, we started hiking, we got the uh, data book out, and he would highlight roads and say these are the roads that you should should focus on. Um, and I was teaching uh, middle school until the day before we left for the trail. And I didn't, and I think I also had sort of banked knowledge of the trail from when she did it in 2008 and I had already done the support. So for her it was kind of, she knew what she was gonna do, she was just gonna hike. For me it was uh, using prior knowledge and, and our friend's knowledge to, uh, to not 
get turned around on the roads. And I have a pretty good sense of direction, too, so I could rely on that. So we didn't really plan that part very much at all, and we kind of did it on the fly, realized that we needed, we might, it might be beneficial for Jen to have some people to hike with her and give her some help that way. Yeah. After all this journey of life that you have, how can Jennifer define herself? Not by hiking. Surprisingly, I, I mean, that's been key for me, even going for the record, as I thought, I have, to be, I have to be fulfilled whether we set this or not. And the trail for me, um, that first journey was so important because it taught me it's okay to just be me. It is. And the natural setting helps you feel natural. It helps you be yourself. But um, being a hiker doesn't define me. I have a really wonderful family. and. A strong faith, and as long as I can, I'm going to hike and walk and run, but it's not the only thing. So I think, the, I think what frustrated me about the questions is everyone focused on the end result. No one asked about what got us there, and no one realized that the things that helped us do well on the record could be applied to anything in life. Like, we run a small company, and the trail was my business school. Yeah, it's going to be just like Google. Right now, it's possible. Uh, but the trail was my business school. Like it taught me how to budget and work with all different types of people and not give up. I mean, that's a huge thing with a small business. So, I think it's got a lot of good, really good lessons, and it helps you figure out your strengths while you're out there. Yeah. So I do think I want to show the last slideshow. If y'all have more questions, we'll be hanging out. You guys probably need to work, but we'll be here, and we can sign books, and we want to. Thank y'all, and really thank Andrew, too, for making this possible. So we'll conclude with this last two-minute slideshow. Dream.